celebrate him, let's celebrate him. Jesus Christ, the Lord, the Savior, the King, the Healer, the Provider, our God and our Savior. Let's celebrate him. Amen. Amen. This morning, that is the God we worship. Please tap somebody next to you and tell them that Jesus is the God that I worship today. Amen, amen. What a beautiful thing to worship that God that we are talking about. Okay, let's now put our hands together and celebrate our own service host here. He's done very good in leading us. Buenas <laughs> ifiwe. And I think he was a little shy to let us know, or perhaps he just forgot. Today we have a very special guest among us. One who has not been with us for the last two months or around yeah, two to three months. Th four months. She's not been with us. I would like us to celebrate Mrs. Ken Martin, Shelly Martin. Shelly, where are you? Is she around? Oh, yes, there she is right at the back. We have missed you, but we are so excited to have you here. And thank you that you have brought us a new member of the church. We have a new member who is four months old. Thank you so much, Elder Ken. This is a good job. Keep doing these things, and the church will grow. <laughs> it's part of the ordination of God. That he has given to us. Something has been happening to you, Elder Ken. I don't understand. Every time the Lord is visiting me, he also visits with you around the same thing. So we met yesterday in the wedding here. And he looked at the way I was dressed and the way he was dressed. And he was telling me, Rev, I sensed in the spirit that you'll be dressed like this. So I dressed like this as well. You know, so similar. And then I made a joke to him. And I told him, Try me tomorrow. Try and see whether you'll copy what I'm going to wear tomorrow. Because I knew I have never worn what I'm going to be wearing tomorrow. Now look, he has copied me again. Where were Elder Ken? Where were? <laughs> Stop spying on me. But something else happened when I was praying early in the morning today. I was praying for the church. I was praying for all of you. The Lord put it so strongly in my spirit. And he said... This grace that you have spoken so long for the last one month and some weeks, I want you today to take time and make a special prayer over God's people that they will receive this grace. Before I did it, Ken Martin stood here and he did it. I don't need to do it again. Please, would you want to rise up on your feet and lift up your hands to this God? I want us to receive this grace. I know Elder Ken has prayed. And Elder Ken, honestly, everything the Lord is downloading on me is downloading on you. You did it so specifically, the way I got it. So this is of God. Do you believe it? This is of God. In other words, God desired in this service of today, 13th of, of, of February Sunday, at this hour, he will be releasing this grace, so that we are not talking about this grace. We are as well receiving it. He will be releasing this grace upon somebody. Is that, if that somebody is you, just raise up your hand and say, this is me. I receive that grace now. The grace that has been spoken in this altar. The grace that the Lord has spoken to us about. I receive it now. I walk in this grace. I experience this grace in Jesus' mighty name, I believe it. Amen. Amen. Do you believe it? Come on, give him a mighty, mighty hand clap if you do, as you have your seats. Amen. This is going to be an interesting year. If you remember my first sermon in this, uh, in this year, I think it was 30th, Sunday 30th. I said this year is going to be interesting. Part of the things we will experience this year will be surprises. Do you remember that sermon, 30th? If you didn't, please just go and fetch it from our online and you will be able to follow it. Surprises. Surprises from 
the Lord will be part of all these here. Wonders and surprises and shocks because of what the Lord is going to be doing among us. Why? Because this year is a year of grace. And we say when it is grace, it overrides any logic. When it is grace, you cannot package it and fit it to your understanding. Therefore, it will be a surprise. It will be a wonder. It will be a shock to you. It's going to be a mix of that. But at the same time, because it is grace, it's going to be many times you can't understand. I confess to you that I have not understood many things from January 1st up to today. I have labored in his presence. There is great opposition to the theme that God has given us this year. And the, the issue is, in the midst of the opposition, grace is released upon us. Are you getting the point? Come on, are you getting the point? Last Sunday, we spoke about, I was introducing a new series in the February, and I said we will be talking about the overflow of grace and godliness in a number of areas. And so, last Sunday we talked about the overflow of grace and godliness in a godless age. What do you do? Is it possible to live godly lives when everything around us is godless? Is that possible? That's what we talked about last Sunday. If you missed it kindly, go back and you'll we'll be able to access that in our, in our YouTube. Today, I speak to us about the overflow of grace and godliness in the midst of difficult and lack. Is it possible to live a godly life? When all that is around you is difficult and it is luck, is it possible to live a godly life? I believe these are some of the questions that have lingered a lot in our minds. The last two years have not been easy. And it is possible that these and many other such questions Keep coming to us. Is it possible, brethren, in a world surrounded with difficult and lack and poverty to live a godly life? Is that possible? That's our, our consideration today. And I would like us to read our main scripture comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and we will be reading from verse 1 to verse 5. That's our mother scripture. I don't know what version is this, but we can read it together. Would you mind we make it our way that every time we are reading the scripture, we stand up. It's in honor of him. Thank you so much. Let's stand up quickly as we read 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I'd like us to read from verse 1 to verse 5. If I count to three, there we are. We move on. One, two, three. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, employing us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of ministering to the saints. Verse 4, verse 5. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord. And then to us and by the will of God. Shall we pray? We commend ourselves to you, gracious 
and loving Father. We are here for the ministry of your word. Let your word go as forth this morning. Allow that grace will overflow over our hearts and over our lives. And so we sit, Lord, and we receive of you. Let every word that is intended for me come deeply in my spirit and in my heart and let it accomplish the will and the purpose of God over my life today, making me wiser to live for God in such an age as this. We give you thanks, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, we pray and believe. Amen. Kindly, let's have our seats. Thank you. I am hoping that the teachings that we give you here are helpful to your lives. If that is true, kindly show me by the lifting of your hand. Thank you so much. I am hoping that you take the word of the Lord serious. For therein is life and victory in every circumstance that you might be going through. The answer to every situation that you are in is in the spoken word of the Lord. And this morning as you sit there and just listen to this vessel of the Lord. The vessel may be weak in a number of ways, but the word of the Lord is mighty and powerful to establish victory and blessings over your lives. That's my prayer for you. And so, I'd like you to imagine with me. I'd like you to imagine with me that you are a good brother. You are a good sister. You are a believer in God. No doubt you are born again and you are living a life of faith faithfully. You serve in the church. You pray and you fast whenever it is necessary or you are prompted by the church or by God. But even after doing all those things, when you look at your life, all that is around you is afflictions and all kinds of trials and luck. Seems like all those things that are not good have all and come together around you. While you serve, while you give yourself, while you do all the good things you do in worship and in service of God, all these terrible things, afflictions, the Bible calls them, trials, poverty, luck, weaknesses, difficulties, are all over around you. And if you might have listened to the service host, again, he, he, he in quotes, stole from me, all I stole from him. He talked of about a throne of grace. He talked of a God who is gracious. He talked of a God who is concerned. And he is touched by your infirmities. So even as I describe these things, I'd like you to keep that in mind. You may have lost your job or your business may have gone south in this season. Or it may be that you have just never quite gotten a proper means of income. You are in the category of those some politicians are calling hustlers. And they hustle here. You get out of here, you just walk like this and you get something to do. And you have your 200 shillings and you're able to buy something. You hustle. Your life, it's about hustling. You are a believer. You are saved. You love the Lord. You pray. You fast. You give. You do all those things. But there is difficult and afflictions. You, try, you have tried to look for a job. You are a college graduate, a university graduate. You are a good man and a good woman. And you try to look for a job and you haven't gotten. And as it is, 
you struggle placing a meal on the table. Is somebody a witness of what I'm talking about here? Maybe not even now, maybe sometimes ago. If you are a witness of what I'm, what I'm talking about, just raise your hand. It's a struggle to place a meal on the table. Payment of your rent right now after this. You will play those cat and mouse games with the landlord. Because the landlord has been threatening you. You struggle with the very basic of life. If you are a family person, your children and your wife or your husband cannot understand what manner of a dad you are who cannot provide for his family. You're not able to feed your family. And as a man, and I would like you to know, ladies, when a man is in that position, a man feels a failure. You feel so much a failure. You have a wife, you have children, and you cannot put a meal for them on the table. Worse off, if your house is closed, you know, they put those padlocks when you are in the church here. May that not happen to anybody here. May grace suffice for you that you will not go and find a padlock in your house. And there you are with your wife and children and you come and what you meet is a lock from the landlord. And you feel bad. Man, are you with me? How do you feel? You, you feel terrible. Hey, yeah, this guy has got in it. You feel terrible. What do I do, Lord? You cannot steal because you're born again. You can't lie. You can't cheat. But the question still lingers. What do you do? What do you do in such a situation? And I very much know that what I am describing, we are very well familiar with it. Either now or in our past, or even in our future that is coming. Now, I would like you to know from the story that we have read in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, that was the situation with the churches in Macedonia. Paul tells us about these churches, and he says, these churches in Macedonia, Macedonia was a region, call it a province, a region on the north of Greece, and it was a Roman uh, province in those days, and the region had quite a number of churches, so we are not talking about one church, it was a number of churches, the church of Philippi, the church of Thessalonica, the church of Berea, and several other churches are part of what we are talking about here. Paul says about these churches in Macedonia that these churches had great trials and afflictions. Other versions put it even more difficult. And they say they had severe trials and afflictions. I'd like you to imagine that. Severe trials. Great trials and afflictions is what they were going through. And as if that was not enough, he also describes and he says, they lived in deep poverty and lack. Some versions say extreme poverty. I don't know how many of us know what the Bible is talking about here. You see, friends, when the Bible talks about something that is extreme, Something that is great trial and affliction. I would like you to imagine what that would be. How many of you know that the Bible does not exaggerate? Paul is not exaggerating here. He is talking of a reality that was happening in a church like this church. In churches actually in a region. Like the churches in Nairobi. The churches in Eastlands of Nairobi. And all that. He talks about deep Poverty. Extreme poverty. I don't know what that means. But that must have been serious. Severe trials and afflictions. I 
That is the stage of the churches in Macedonia. So we have, as we consider our topic today, we have a very good example to learn from. A people we are told they were in that difficult. They were in great trials, afflictions, deep poverty, extreme lack and poverty. And they stand to us, to you and I today, as an example. As we ask our question, is it possible to live a life that is not only godly, but a life that overflows with godliness in a situation like that? And so, I'd like you to figure out yourself as part of that church. Imagine you are the elder Ken in such a kind of a church. Imagine you are a member, you serve in that church, one of those churches that are in such afflictions. Picture yourself as a member there. What would be your response to such a situation? How would you respond to such a situation? Is it okay I give you a minute, you turn to the person next to you, and just, just in, from the top of your head, just, just share what would be your response. If you're a member of such a church, remember deep poverty, extreme poverty, severe trials and afflictions all over around, that is what surrounds you. What would be your response as a member of that church? How would you respond to such? If you found yourself a member of that church, worse off if you are an elder in that church, worse off if you are a pastor of that church. You better talk because I'm likely to ask somebody to say something. So that might be you. What would be your response to such a situation? You know, one of the things that encourages me in this scripture, I think you are through by now. One of the things that encourages me in this scripture is that it is possible to have a godly church that worships God, that is genuine, that is honest, that is true, that is following after God, but they still go through challenges and difficulties. It's possible. That is encouraging. Those of you who know sometimes where we have passed through and where we are, that for me is very encouraging. But let me tell you how some of us would respond. Some of us would respond by quitting that church. You run away from that church. You go and look for more richer churches. But are there no more richer churches? By the way, our mother church, Nairobi Chapel, Gong Road, is a million times a more richer church than we are. You can quit and go there. You can run and go there. And that would be some of the response of some of us who run away and go to a more richer church. You know, people love evading where there is trouble. Where there seems to be difficult and we want to go where there is easy. I've never understood why people are so eager about going to America. How many of you are eager about going to America? Be very honest. You know, God may answer you. Uh, <laughs> you know why I have seen you, my brother. <laughs> you know why I have been in that land many times. I have stayed there several months in that land. Let me be frank to you. In that land, everything works. Everything just works. Things are good. Life is LG. How many of you have been in America? Okay. <laughs> I know you don't want to brag. I know, I, I know you are very humble and you don't want to say it. <laughs> but that land is great. Everything just works. 
if you lose a job today, by evening you might have gotten another job. That's the kind of opportunities that are there. And people lie, people cheat, people take fake statements to the embassy of America, people lie, death, and other things to get an opportunity to go to America, including believers. We are so eager to go where things are working. Not many of us want to stay where we can make things work. Let me tell you, I keep telling my children, I talk a lot with my children on this. I have no pleasure of America. And I think that's why they don't deny me visa. Every time I go there, like now my visa is expired. I'm going to be going there very soon. They don't deny me. They just look at me and they realize this guy doesn't care. You give it to me, I go. Praise God. You don't give it to me, I'm home. And home is better than any other place. I don't care. I have nothing. Even if they gave me a free, what do you call that thing? Eh? Green card. Even if they just gave me without applying for it, I will not use it. I will basically use it for visiting for a few weeks, a month, two months, maximum, and I come back home. You know why? I am a strong believer in being part of a process to make things work. If America things are working, somebody put their hands on the ground to make things work. Kenya must work. And I must be part of those who are making Kenya to work. I don't want to ride on what others have done. I pride in being part of a Kenya. Let me tell you how much I love this land. And I pray for this land. I don't think there's any land in the whole world that is better than this. I've been in China, been in Asia, been in different places. I don't think there's any better land than this. Why don't we clap for our land, Kenya? It is the very best. But many people run away. Many people evade when things are difficult, when things seem not to be working. But hear me, even if you run away from this church, and you go to the church which is rich, where things look cozy, where things, you know, there are those lights. There are smoke. Did you know churches have smoke? <laughs> smoke lights and screens and everything, like our mother church and like a few other churches that I know. Even if you go there, hear me and listen to me. If your trouble is ordained of God, it will follow you there. <laughs> That's the bad news. That's the bad news. You go to any, your trouble will follow you there if it is ordained of God. You better learn to cooperate with this God, then things will work for you. Others will quit, quit the church and just go and just decide this thing called church doesn't work for me. Others will not quit the church. They will hang in there, but they will not be significantly engaged in any way. They like church, but this thing called church doesn't seem to work for them anyway. So, yes, I like church. You know, it feels good. It's costly to say, I'm from church with my family. It feels very good. But there's nothing else that you do. They compromise their faith. They cheat. But they are in church every Sunday. Hanging in there. Although they are not quitting. Let me give you a testimony. And I keep missing my time. So kindly be showing me time so that I stop. <laughs> I'm the kind of a preacher who keeps me seeing time. Please forgive me. And the people, Celeste, please help me. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Let me give you a testimony. On the 24th of December, 1994, I don't know where you were. I was a jobless young man having finished university. I cleared university in 93. And I was looking for a job. I had no money. I was such a believer. I think I was a more believer than today. My life was lived in prayer and fasting. I had not met this, met this lady, ask her when she met me. I had no meat. <laughs> she was insulted by several people who got to know about it. Because... I was tiny, thin. I didn't have money for food many times. But also when the money is there, I'm fasting. I actually was fasting so many days. And I still remember on that day, 24th of December, it was the seventh day of my prayer and fasting. 
I don't even remember whether I had fare to go where I lived in Umojato. I didn't have a house to stay in. And so I lived with a friend who was a high, high school whatever, um, classmate, but also from our village. He was not born again, but he's the only one who could give me a boat. And I needed a couple of months to stay there so that I walk out my way out. And so this day, 24th of December, 1994 comes. And as I, I was eager to go home, I actually didn't have money for food to open the fast. I went there and this gentleman was in there. Him was working. And I couldn't open the fast. I stayed until 7 when he arrived. When he came, he was gracious. I said, hey, Mike, how are you doing? I said, I'm hungry. <laughs> and he said, okay, fine. Just get this money, buy some meat, and come and fix something. I was so excited. Went and got a kilo of meat, came and fixed it, and ugali. How many of you know what that is when you have been fasting? I didn't care about fasting. That meat, I hogged it. And so we ate with him. After a short time, he told me, allow me to just... Get out here briefly. I can't sleep so early. About nine. And so he left. When he came at midnight, it was impossible for me to stay in that room. You know, how many of you know Umoja two rooms? It's just one room. It is the kitchen. It is everything. Everything is there. The way he arrived at midnight, I couldn't stay there. And I would like you to figure out in those days, there were no phones. It is midnight. I can't call anybody. The matatos are finished. I can't go anywhere. And this gentleman, the way he has come, I can't stay there. And I figured out, Lord, and I've just finished the fasting. I thought you would be gracious to me. Because nimemaliza to fasting. Unifanyye mambo mzuri mzuri. Because nime fast seven days. A pastor friend of mine said to God, if this is the way you treat the people you love most, no wonder you have so few. <laughs> That's how God treated me after seven days. And so guess what, friends? I actually walked out. And I stood outside there from midnight until morning. Standing like this until morning. <laughs> I didn't have any place to go. There were no matatos. I couldn't call anybody. I stood there. I was fisted by mosquitoes. I tried to go to a bathroom. Those who know how the bathrooms are in Umajato. There, there were more mosquitoes there. And so I came outside and I stood like a lorry the whole night standing. Nani Maliza? Fasting. Was off the following morning, I was leaving for a seven days mission to Siaya Town, 1994, 25th of December, is when we were leaving with a team of us that we were going together. Sometimes life can be hard. Sometimes afflictions and troubles can be a lot. And in that state of my difficult, the whole night, Satan was ministering to me. You know that guy ministers. And he was asking me, this God of yours, you keep saying he is a loving God. How can he test you on such a basic thing like shelter? Why can't he give you shelter and then test you another thing? This God doesn't love him. Quit, he, quit him. He doesn't love you. Are you familiar with what I'm talking about? I struggled with that Satan, those thoughts in me, telling me God is not fair, God is not good, God is bad, quit him. How can he test you like this? Let me move on, I might come back to that story. But today I am here, that was 24th of December, 1994. And today is 13th of February, 2022, many years after that, and I'm here preaching the same Jesus. I'm declaring that he is good. I'm declaring he is faithful. I'm declaring he answers prayers. Even if I sleep outside there, I will sleep, and after that, I will go declare his name. And so I joined with my friends, and we went to Siaya. <laughs> and a whole week we were there. I was in charge of the intercession. I loved intercession. So I did not go preaching out there. I was in prayer. And I wondered why God did not really speak to me. This is what happened. On the same night that I was going through all this, my sister, the one I follow, died that night. And I didn't know. There were no phones. I'm in Siaya. They can't get me. So I come back on 2nd of January, and I meet somebody in the streets, and he's telling me, where have you been? 
And I said, I've been preaching someplace, so you don't know what happened. He tells me, your sister is dead and buried. Same night. What do you do? Paul gives us testimonies of this church in Macedonia. That our hearts may be encouraged and understand that it is possible to live for God in the midst of every difficulty. Three things that caught the attention of Paul about the church in Macedonia. Three things that caught the attention of Paul. And I believe, friends, these are the most difficult things. When you are going through such a difficult moment, afflictions, trials, and severe deep poverty, these are the most difficult, difficult, Things to ever do as a believer in such a situation. Paul says, number one, that which caught his attention about this church. While they are in such a great trials of affliction, while they are in deep poverty as they were in, Paul says, number one, they give themselves to God. This is verse eight. They give themselves to God. Paul was among them for ministry. He looked, he observed, and it was very clear to him that these churches, although in such a deep trouble, have given themselves to God. They gave themselves to God. Would like to, you do like to help me preach and tell somebody, they gave themselves to God. And I am encouraged to know that live alone an individual, it is possible to testify about not only a church, but churches. Not only a church, but churches that are known for giving themselves to God. And my prayer is that Nairobi Chapel Imara shall be a church that shall be known for giving ourselves to the God of heaven, regardless of the situation around us. They gave themselves to God. That was the first very, how does it happen? That you are suffering, you are in deep poverty, you are in trials and afflictions, and in the midst of it, you give yourself more to God. How does that work? This church teaches us. Secondly, they, this church, they were overflowing with joy. This is first too. It talks about the abundance of their joy. The overflow of their joy. How does this work? Are you in shock and surprise like me? How do a people in such deep poverty... And luck. How do a people in such affliction overflow and abound with such a joy as Paul discovered in this church? You know, James chapter 1 and verse 2, the Bible says, consider it, consider it pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of, of many kinds, trials of many, consider it pure joy, not just joy. Consider it pure joy because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. That's the purpose of God in allowing these trials. They were overflowing with? They were overflowing with? Number one is they gave themselves to? Number three, number three, they were overflowing in giving and generosity. This is, this is contradiction. A church in deep poverty and lack, they are now said to be overflowing in Giving and generosity. He says they gave more than they could even beyond their own ability. 
I wonder what they were giving. They were overflowing with joy. They gave beyond their ability. I would like to take an opportunity and encourage somebody here. And I know a number of us, you have been so faithful in giving. You do not have much. But I know that a hundred shillings you have been giving as your tithe. I want to say much grace over your life in Jesus' name. Do not ever be ashamed to give that 50 bob, to give that 20 bob, to give that 100 bob. If that is all that you have, that you can overflow with as you serve the Lord. Do not ever look down upon your giving, however small it is. Even though men may not acknowledge it, in heaven it is acknowledged. That's why there is a testimony about this church. Not because they gave more than any other, but they gave more willingly, more cheerfully, and they gave beyond. God treasures every effort to give much more. You have only 100 shillings. And you are desiring to give. Let me tell you some of the things we used to do in some, the church I used to be. We would plan to give. <laughs> Did you know you can actually plan what to give the Lord as tithe this year? Tithe is what? 10% of your income. Just decide what you're going to give this year. And say, God, this year I want to give you 100,000 as my tithe. Now, <laughs> that may not be commensurate to your income. But if you make it to give 100. Thousand, what is your income? What is 90% of a hundred thousand? 900,000 will be your income. So you can determine what you want to be your income. Just say it, I'll give it. Because what will happen is the whole of your system and everything will be sure that they want to make it work, that I give the hundred thousand. I still remember doing that. It is actually what made me sell my car because I had given a pledge of 600,000. Those days when I had very little. Allow me to continue. Because Celeste is on my back there. Paul therefore makes a conclusion. After observing these things that are difficult to explain. Paul makes a conclusion. And he says this cannot be normal. It can't be normal. It can only be a grace from God upon these people. It can't be normal. How can people overflow with joy in such a situation? How can they overflow with such a giving and generosity? How can they overflow like that in such a situation? This was the conclusion of Paul. It cannot be normal. And so he writes to the Corinthians in chapter 8 verse 1, the scripture that we have just read. And he said to them, brethren, we would want you to know about this grace that has been given to the churches in Macedonia. We want you to know that there is something called grace that works. And it has been given to the churches in Macedonia. There is a grace that is responsible for such kind of a lifestyle. There is a grace. Come on, say with me. There is a grace. That was Paul's conclusion. This grace works in believers. This grace empowers, enables believers to do that which in, in a normal situation they would not be able to do. That is the work of this grace. And that grace is here with you today. So Paul makes a conclusion for us. Yes, it is possible to overflow in godliness in the midst of all Difficult and lack. Why? There is a? There is a? There is a grace. There is a grace. So, yes, we can. Say with me. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. We can live a godly life. Say it with me. We can live a godly life. In the midst of lack. It's thereafter in chapter 9 that Paul now moves on and says, there is not just grace, but I want you guys to know that this God we are talking about, he is able. This is our theme scripture, chapter 9 and verse 8. He now says, and this God is able. Oh, I love that. I never see saying that. 
Please say with me, God is able. God is able. He's able to make the grace I'm talking about. And not only that grace. He's able to make all grace. I wish you were standing. I would have asked you to jump with me. All grace. This God is able to make. All grace. Martin. Pastor Martin. Work towards you. So that in all things. In everything. Having all sufficiency. You may abound to every good work. You may abound to godliness. Because you have all sufficiency. This God is able. You have no reason not to live a godly life. And if I finish preaching there, I will have preached to you. See you I will have preached to you. There is a grace and this God is able. Celeste, do I have two minutes? It's important to learn how to save God. That environment of grace so that you may be able to access the grace and make it work for you. Allow me to just mention... I'll just mention a few things that you need to do, safeguarding the grace environment so that you are able to access. You see, these things have been freely given to us. You do not need to struggle like a non-believer. Hear me. You are not supposed to struggle with lust like a non-believer. There is a grace that has come over you. You can access. You do not need to struggle with drinking and all those other things. There is a grace, but you need to learn how to safeguard that environment. Let me just mention a few things because of time. Number one, you need to guard your attitude and your thoughts as you go through that difficult situation. That's what I see these guys, they did. They guarded their attitude and their thoughts. The Macedonian churches were in trouble, yes, but they did not allow themselves to waste their time thinking about their troubles and thinking about their afflictions and their poverty. That's a waste. They preoccupied themselves with how they could serve God even better. They kept asking themselves, what is it that is there that we can still do to serve this God? That was their pre preoccupation. They guarded their attitude and their thoughts. Do you know many times how we get into that attitude and we say, this God is not faithful. This God is not answering me. I have prayed. I have fasted. I have waited for him to get, um, give me a baby, to give me a husband, to give me a job, to give me all these things. He doesn't seem to be. And you sink in some, some attitude and some thoughts that are unproductive. When you spend more time thinking about your problems, you magnify the problem instead of magnifying the God who is your God. You actually empower the problem over you. When you spend too much time thinking about your problem, you empower the problem more than you empower God in you. And you know what will happen. The problem will take over your life instead of God taking over. You start feeling problems everywhere. A small thing you feel on this side of the head, there is trouble. A small thing on your toe, there is trouble. In your ear, on your, you start feeling trouble everywhere. Because you have preoccupied yourself. Bible says, as a man thinketh, so. As a man thinketh, so he is. You cannot think constantly of problems and hope to arrive as a solution. It's impossible. If your life is about thinking problems, you will never arrive at solutions. You need to have solution mind, solution thoughts, solution attitudes for you to arrive at solution. You can't harbor failure thoughts and attitude and arrive at success and victory. It's impossible. We need a renewing of mind that brings transformation in our life. If you, all grace will overflow in your life, in all situations, in all circumstances, you got to train your thoughts and train your attitudes like this church. Romans 12 and verse 1, the Bible says, do not conform to the patterns of this world. Don't do it the way they do it. Don't talk the way they talk. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind through the word of God. Philippians 2 verse 5, the Bible says, let this attitude such as was in Christ be in you. That although he was God, 
he did not consider it robbery, that he would leave all that and come and live an earthly life like a human being. That's the attitude when you are in that situation. That's how to manage. That's how to go through that situation as you wait upon this God. You see, grace works in two ways. I promise Celeste, if I petition with one minute, I'll buy her lunch. Now it seems like the lunch will have to go. Grace works in two ways, guys. God's grace. You see, God's grace can come in the miraculous. Do you remember the, the story of uh, the story of the story of, of, of Peter in Luke chapter 5. We did it in our first Sunday this month. You remember? The fish. God will just come. And because of grace, he allows great fish to come into you. That's a miraculous. God can do that. That's one of the ways God does. But there is another way God does. And not Celeste is very happy she has lunch. There is another way that God comes. There is another way God comes. And many times he will surprise us with this miracle. Miraculous breakthrough. That you can't explain. That can't be within logic. God works in grace like that. But also God works according to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. He says to Paul. Paul was in prayer. And he had a thorn in the flesh. He had a difficult. He had a hard circumstance. And God responds and says, mm -mm, mm -mm, I will not answer this prayer. Why? My grace is sufficient. Even in that trouble. That's still grace. So what does God do? He doesn't allow you to wallow and have pain and die there. God, by grace, by what? He raises your capacity that that issue which is your problem is no longer a problem. You are raised above it by grace so that it becomes insignificant. It becomes trivial around you. You have a problem, but you don't go feeling it. You have a problem, you don't go talking about it everywhere. You are raised. Why? My grace is sufficient. So there will be those moments when God will come miraculously. There will be those moments when God will let you know, I have grace apportioned for you. In other words, I will not leave you in trouble. I will raise your capacity to operate beyond these troubles that are around you. There has to be an adjustment of our thinking and our attitude. Okay, let me just mention these others and then I stop. Number two, how do you keep that environment? You need to guard your heart, your words, and your language. Guard your heart to secure that environment of grace. Guard your heart. Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart with all diligence. For out of it flows the springs of life. And again, Matthew 12, 34. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. God, what flows out of your mouth? This is what we see in this church. They did not say we are poor, so we cannot give. When the others were giving towards Jerusalem, the, the poor brethren in Jerusalem, they said, they urged Paul, don't leave us. Please come and take our offering. And they are poor. They didn't have an attitude of poverty. One of the worst things that you can have is to have an attitude of poverty. You will never think right. You will never make it because an attitude and a thought of poverty. But even their language. They say, come, we will also give. It doesn't matter how much. But we will, we will give. God, what proceeds from your mouth. Bible says, let the weak say, and let the poor say. And the Bible says, life and death. Is in the power of the tongue. God, what flows from your mouth? And that is by guarding your heart. And finally, I have actually finished. <laughs> guard your actions and guard your steps. Guard your... And guard your steps. Three things I've told you that are very key. Your attitude and thinking. The words from your mouth and the actions that you carry every day will determine a lot how you go through every situation. Will determine a lot how grace keeps flowing. And because God observed this happening, he kept giving grace. Do you think God, if he gave the church in Macedonia grace to give, do you think he could not give them grace to be rich? He's the same God. But he was waiting for them to excel in one or two things. And as they do that, he gives more grace. 
Watch out. The attitude of your mind. The thoughts that processes in your mind. Watch out the words that flow from your, from your mouth. Guard your heart. And watch out the actions and the step. You see, our actions flow from our thoughts. As a man thinketh, so our actions flow from what you think. So you think something through your attitude, okay? You speak it, and as you speak it, you become what you have spoken. If you say, I am poor, you are poor. That's what the Bible says. Let the poor say, and let the weak say, let's stand up on our feet. If the Lord has spoken to you, and you know that he has spoken to you, I do not know what you are going through. I do not know what is happening around your life. But I know you need a grace. I know. How many of you know that you need a grace around you? This grace works. If it worked for the Macedonian church, this grace will work on me. Regardless of the circumstance. Regardless of the situation. Regardless of the difficult around you. This grace works. And this grace, it's available for you. Lift up your hand right now. In the name of Jesus, we want to repeat the prayer we prayed in the beginning. Father, we declare your grace from this altar. We declare the overflow of your grace from this altar. We speak it with authority because we have a conviction that you have put it in our hearts to speak it. And now I ask in Jesus' name, as we have spoken and declared on this altar of the Lord, this grace that is able to carry us through in moments of difficulty, in moments of lack, in moments of trials and affliction, I release that grace right now of our God's people. Let it be, Lord. Raise your hand and receive it. Let it be, Jesus. Let it be, Jesus. Let it come upon these, your servants. Let it come upon their life, upon their marriage, upon their finances, upon their job. Let it come upon their relations. Let this grace overflow upon every situation in their lives. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Come on, open your mouth and say, I receive the grace to carry me through in every trial, in every affliction. If it works for Macedonia, it will work for me. I believe it and I receive it. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Come on, give him a mighty, mighty hand clap. Celebrate him, celebrate him. Is there somebody who says, Pastor, I want you to pray for me. I want to give my life to Jesus. His grace is the one that brings salvation. Is there such a person? I don't want to sit and leave you here. You have come here, you know you're not saved. You have heard of this grace that brings life, that brings salvation. I'd like to pray with you. This is what happened to me a couple of years ago. Is there someone who says, Pastor, pray with me? I want to receive this grace. This is how it happens. This is how it works. There is no other way. That salvation comes to the heart of a man. You're here and you know you want to receive Jesus. Raise your hand. Fear no man. This is before God. Thank you, Lord. Bless your people. Lord, I also ask that you release this grace upon Nairobi Chapo Imara as a church. May it be said of this church a church, a church that gives. A church that experiences grace to give. A church that experiences grace to overflow with the joy of the Lord. And I pray that this is so in the name of God the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If you believe it, you say? Amen. Amen. God bless you.